We're actually in initiating a process at ISHLT that focuses on recording the ongoing history of this society of ISHLT as it parallels the history of heart transplantation, lung transplantation, and mechanical circulatory assist devices. And we're initiating the interview process with some of our leaders as you have been in this field. So we would like to ask you a few questions, if we may. So welcome. Thank you. What was there in your early education that might have influenced you in becoming a physician? Looking back, I don't think that any classroom experience or course uh, really influenced me. I don't believe that there was as much science or currently the biology that students today have access to. Um, I think it's probably more personal commitment. I had several family members who had health problems I was participating in as a young, early teenager and so forth, and it just seemed to be a decision by 15, 16, and it's been there ever since, really, and never considered much of anything else. So that's what really attracted you to medicine then, just uh, the fact that people in your family had been ill and it, you began questioning? Yes, it just seemed like a natural for me, and I think the gratification uh, that you see and the involvement and the personal connect is what brought me into the field. What sparked your interest initially in heart failure? I, uh, I was gravitated into the area of uh, critical care and coronary care, and that was largely people at that time with heart attacks and, and really advanced heart failure. It was an interest the the hemodynamics, the physiology, the treatment modality. So all those things kind of had me gravitating. And I, my first job was running a coronary medical intensive care unit. And as such, I got a pretty good exposure to that. And it happened to be at St. Louis University, which was also one of the pioneering in the Midwest uh, areas for heart transplantation and mechanical assist devices. I think in 82, it was Stanford, St. Louis University in Pittsburgh. So. I was really fortunate to get an experience, and so obviously that was an application of very advanced heart failure, and that's really where that began. So the area that's interesting is the evolution of describing a cardiologist in the field of heart transplantation and mechanical support. It really was um, an early time in about the mid-80s when everybody was really pretty sparse in terms of cardiologists involved in the field of transplant and mechanical support. And uh, we hosted a meeting in St. Louis of the 15 or so people I could identify around the country. And as such, that began and it became quite a network and then evolved into being the working group of transplant cardiologists and then finally the cardiac transplant research database. So that was the evolution of solidifying heart failure as a discipline within heart transplantation and mechanical support. And uh, it's grown to be quite now a specialty. It has. Um what, how do you recall the events of 1967 when you first heard that Christian Bernard had done a heart transplant? What were your thoughts? And I was still in college, and it, was, uh, it, it got a lot of press, and it seemed like quite an exciting thing. Even early on, I was committed in the field of cardiovascular medicine or surgery, and so this seemed like a really provocative uh, new advanced therapy that kind of stayed in my mind, and part of the decision to go to St. Louis University, again, is where they had done the first heart transplant in the Midwest. I was fascinating reading how they did the operation, and it was, uh, it was quite memorable. I think probably because I was interested in going into medicine and thought this was one of the most uh, cutting-edge things I'd ever heard of. When did you see your first heart transplant patient? When did you take care of your first heart, tra heart transplant recipient? 1982. Wow. I just came right out of training to take this job, and uh, as such, they had a program going. It was still relatively modest in size. I think we did six or seven the first year, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, it had been a typical surgical discipline, and they were quite busy at the university at that time, and so who was going to take care of them in the post-operative era? And I did, like many people, a, a, a stint for about a week uh, at Stanford with Sharon Hunt. Oh, yeah. And that's where, that was the totality of my background to go back home then and run a, a transplant program, which I did there for about 15 years and have ever since been running transplant programs. And that was really before cyclosporine, 1982. It had just come in. Yeah. It had just uh, gone forward. And that's clearly where the birth of transplantation began. And, and I think they were just, you know, we look at the dosing that we were using three times what we do now. and just really getting a handle and um, and so it's been an interesting evolution of watching these advances in the field but yeah from the very beginning that became my love. I'd, I'd done four years of surgical training and so 
transplantation, being in the operating room, you know, those kinds of situations were very comfortable for me on both sides, and I think that made the surgeons similarly comfortable with me, and so it became a really a natural evolution for me. Do you feel then, with the evolving issues around transplantation, do you feel that's where your training then took you? Um, I don't know that it, uh, it was the fact that transplantation was going to go forward. It was the fact that cyclosporin had just come on the, on the scene and, and thought that the growth was going to be there. But uh, it was just a natural gravitation because those patients were my patients that needed mechanical support as a bridge to transplant and then got transplanted and took care of them. So it was kind of caught up in the really rapid changes that in the early 80s. You've made an amazing number of contributions to our field of heart failure, uh, transplant, mechanical circulatory assist devices. I don't think I've ever picked up a journal that your name wasn't in there with an article. Um, so what do you think has been your greatest contribution in each of those fields? Wow. Heart failure, mechanical circulatory assist devices, and heart transplantation. Uh, that's a probing question. I, I think heart failure, um, we really worked a lot in the early era about aggressively managing patients and we were one of the early groups to use home inotropes to get people out and managed and stabilized and so forth and I think that's probably the area um, I've been involved in most of the oral heart failure drug trials along the way but as far as a personal contribution I think it was that early era of um, when to refer patients for transplantation, how to maintain them on balloon pumps for a period of time, how to use outpatient inotropes. So it, pretty much in that same arena of advanced heart failure is where I probably made as much contribution in the early era. With transplantation, I think um, we really uh, were one of the groups that did not subscribe to the use of induction therapy and help go forward with saying that 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 didn't add anything and was not an advantage in the field at that time. Um, <clears throat> similarly, I've worked, I think the thing I'm most proud about, I guess, is the connection with the donor-specific allo-reactivity assay, a bioassay. And I just think that's been it's something that we've really worked hard on the last four or five years of using it now to adjust immunosuppressive medicines and would like to go forward with a trial of replacing uh, biopsies potentially with something that says the autoimmune response is not measurable and therefore they're stable and try to forego some of that expense. So um, it's been my real love. I spent two years uh, in Canada on a sabbatical doing basic immunology with Phil Halloran and so that gave me a really a fundamental understanding of pathways and intracellular signaling and mechanisms of immunosuppressive drugs. So I think that's been one of the strengths that hopefully I've had is really understanding immunosuppression at a fundamental level and working to manipulate those, uh, those drug combinations. And then in mechanical circulatory assist devices? Well, I, it, it dates me to tell you that uh, when I started, all the patients were paralyzed and intubated and, you know, it was hurry up and get a transplant because they were not very dependable and so forth. And I think actually our group was the first to describe letting them get out of bed. I mean, it seems so fundamental, but at that time it was a, a real breakthrough of now people getting up and exercising at the bedside and, and moving in that direction. I think more recently, um, the contribution of trying to help emphasize the importance of patient selection and not continually doing people who are so critically sick at the time and that designing ways to better optimize their condition and overall status before they undergo that operation, I think is something I look back on is, is fundamental that everyone everywhere can look at our risk score and say it's not perfect, it's still evolving, but it still is some relative tool you can use before you go to the operating room to say that this is a good patient or not a good patient. And I, I think that'll be one of the things that I feel most proud about. I agree. I think that risk scale has been so helpful to so many transplanters and you know as we look at that it's just really helped us decide when we're the when field our the pendulum are is clearly moving I mean the, the meeting has been full of the intermax reports of the change and less sick patients and I think just raising the specter that if you do patients in this category the 12 15 percent chance of surviving the operation is really a big step and it's really begun to I think take hold so I'm, I'm particularly proud of that and that was developed out of the rematch trial is that right it was actually the the FDA mandated post rematch registry. Okay. So once the 
HeartMate to XVE had been approved, the FDA mandated that they do post-marketing surveillance, and so that was as a registry, and that was the 300 patients that had had that same device for destination therapy for which it was approved, but did things change? And, and that's where we use that group, and again, emphasize that 15 to 18 percent died within the first month, and 26 percent died before they went home, and this was all reinforcement about patient selection, and that's, we derived the variables and then went forward to say it does correlate and you can predict the risk and then move back and forth and so forth. So that, that was, uh, I think, one of the more important contributions. I think a lot of us were kind of surprised as we looked at the actual parameters that were used in that score to think that they would be able to influence them. For instance, the right heart and uh, some of the other lab values. Yes. So it was kind of surprising to find it, out. You know, Linda, when you look back, um, David Farrar and, and others, uh, somewhat writing out of the Thorotech and also the St. Louis U experience, describe renal function and infection and uh, several of the parameters that are in that. So it really, the thing that was different that I think we've missed entirely is nutrition. And serum albumin became a surprising, it's certainly not the best, but it tends to track with the prealbumin and more sensitive markers and specific markers of nutrition. But the point I make whenever I talk about this is that infection has been the number one cause of death since we began doing this. And we've done things to restrain the device, change antibiotics and so forth, and yet it still remains the leading cause of death. And I think we take people very malnourished to that operation. They have post-operative recovery, their metabolic needs are even higher. And so those are the complications that I think directly related to nutrition. And that's the one thing I think that was the number two most powerful predictor. And I think that's something that's really another thing that I think has helped everybody drop back and say, you're right, we really haven't paid as enough attention because these heart failure patients often are quite malnourished mm -hmm. to go into mm -hmm. the operation. What do you see as the greatest challenges for heart transplantation in the future? Well, I think the concept of tolerance has been that holy grail that we've really not quite gotten to. Um, I think what's important as we look at the long term, I think is increasing recognition that rejection is not really the issue, it's the long term morbidity and so-called non-immune adverse events related to the immunosuppressive drugs like steroids and lipids and blood pressure and renal dysfunction and so forth. And I think if we can develop the, the DSA into a relatively reasonable charge where you can say it's safe to move this dose down minimize those side effects and have an assay that's that you're still fine or you've got a blip and you need to come back up a little bit. I think we won't see malignancy be the problem that it has been. We won't see, because they're dominoes. If you have renal insufficiency, blood pressure comes along with it and now you've got several medications in that line that are attendant to that. Whether we'll ever be able to um, do much more with the personalized genomic screening uh, as we look at markers that pretend that you'll be better off with a calcineur inhibitor of this generation or that generation, I, I think we'll get a lot closer into the ideal immunosuppressor regimen and I think we'll have non-invasive tests to look at rejection. It'll be a lot easier to be followed uh, in the outpatient clinic. That goal of, of, of tolerance, it seems that the liver seems to be able to, the liver patients, there's been several of them mm -hmm. that have been described as chimeric. Yes. You know, how are we going to know that with our patients? Yeah, it's, it's harder because kidneys always have a backup of dialysis if, you know, they're wrong, but that's really where the experience, there are probably more kidney patients that stop taking immunosuppression are truly tolerant and, and chimeric, and, and the liver has been so forgiving in many ways. They've been ABO incompatible, so it's a much more tolerant organ. Hearts, when they go bad, you, you really don't. Now we have mechanical support, but that's not great when you're on a suppression. So I, I think it's really defining some of the early stuff about if you hold cyclosporin in the first 24, 48 hours, that you allow the immune system to recognize those foreign antigens, and then you suppress them, and they will begin to become tolerant once they've seen them. I think that stuff um, at Emory and other locations, I think, is one of the, the real forefront of where we want to go. But looking at signaling within the immune response and finding a way to do polypharmacy in terms of blocking the immune response in several different areas, I think will allow us to get lower doses of multiple drugs that will be working in concert to keep the immune suppression down. And I think that's gonna be an advance. The, the drugs just seem to be more tolerable all the time. When did you attend your first ISHLT meeting? What year, do you remember? It was one of the early ones. Um, it probably was uh, in the early 80s, uh, 
that you know, when people talk about there were five guys sitting around the table, as soon as they graduated from into the, the 30 to 40 range, I was, uh, I was there at that time. Uh -huh. yeah. That was pretty As relevant. a token young, not very many cardiologists in the audience. Oh, most yeah. of them were surgeons at Almost that time. Almost all were surgeons, yeah. Interesting. Um, you were actually president of ISHLT, was it 1997 to yes. 1998? Yes. I think I was on the board of directors with yes. you at that time. That was yeah. a long time ago already, wasn't it? Yeah, 12 seems years? Like. Wow. Yeah. So, as president, what do you think your greatest contributions to the society were, and how do you think things have changed since then? Uh, the two areas that I think were most important during my presidency is um, we did a broad approach to writing listing criteria. Um, we used to talk about patients institution shopping and institutions patient shopping that you were too sick at one place not sick enough at another and so forth and so we actually did it across uh, uh, liver and kidney to try and make it now organ specific but really develop some reasonable criteria and a large number of people contributed to writing that but that really went forward now as a completely um, sanctioned agreement of what you should have and limitations before you get transplant so I think on that side of the fence that was it. As a president um, it really was the first time where we moved uh, into looking at the broader representation in the society. Uh, prior to my presidency no one in pulmonary or pediatrics or um, other disciplines, pathology, had been on the board. And uh, clearly uh, that wasn't an intended oversight, but they had just kind of replaced surgeons with surgeons and we had a few cardiologists uh, evolving in that area. So we really began to look at that, began to be more sensitive about geographic uh, distribution and, and you know balance of where people are from and their contribution and so forth. But, I think those are the things I, I look back on. It really brought the, opened the door of bringing in people from many other disciplines onto the board. And how has the society changed over the years? What do you think is? It's very interesting when I sit in on board meetings or we had the president's meeting yesterday and we reflect back on the things that, some of the issues are still on the table. Um, the equity between the European and North American representation, abstract submission, um, I think one of the other things that I, I would reflect back on at the time is trying to draw attention that there was a sensitivity, uh, particularly amongst Europeans, that we were North American centric. And as such, I think no area really benefited from the society. As, as an example, when a, an issue might come up with regard to transplantation or advanced heart failure, we were the international body. And so we had no constituency at the board when they were deciding that we're going to do this with legislation or we want to hear your input and the same thing in Europe when they had problems they couldn't use the imprimatur of the society to really intervene when it was what is Great Britain going to pay for for funding what's the precedent and so forth and so I think beginning to to draw attention as we have now that we've got much more uh, representation in a lot of different areas and people have begun to use the society in a much more uh, parochial local issues as well as uh, in the broader international sense. What do you think is the future of uh, stem cells, how they might be applied in, um, in our area of heart failure? I, I think that um, it's got so much hype that I think the question is will it really meet what people's hopes as well as expectations are. It's, the biology gets better and better, the heart has its resonant stem cells, it's a matter of signaling turning on those cells, but I think the excitement is from the basis of mechanical support because the FDA has seen the devices now totally support the circulation. So if you can use what we refer to as adjunctive therapy, whether it be stem cells or gene therapy, at the time the device goes in, you'll have a chance to see the heart recover in addition to what recovery you might see from the device. And secondly, if they do this in bridge of transplant patients as the protocols are now ongoing, uh, you have a chance to take the heart back out, really study it, because all the stem cell therapy thus far has been in largely acute heart attack victims mm -hmm. who all survive by and large. So we really don't know what happens at a fundamental cellular molecular basis. So I'm really hopeful we've got some new cells now that look like the immune system won't recognize as foreign and can be from a very young donor, could really play a major role. And I'm really excited those trials are just now up and running this year. And uh, I think that's going to be several years before we know the results, but I think it's a very um, 
has a lot of potential uh, to make a big difference in heart failure. And the second area, as I mentioned, is gene therapy. Uh, it was held for a while because of the difficulty of the vector to convey the virus, but I think that's been s stabilized a, a great deal now, and there are two different genes that are being used to treat heart failure, and again, those are just adjunctive. We were interested in a drug, uh, clenbuterol, and I think that still has had more benefit than anything else in helping to induce recovery. So. I think recovery still has to be the holy grail in mechanical support in advanced end-stage heart failure and how to get the heart to recover or define where it's irreversible or really understand new targets for drug and other interventions I think is what is most exciting in the field right now. Do you think that transplantation in and of itself has allowed us the opportunity to look at other ways to prevent heart failure? Uh, I, I think we see people at such an end-stage refractory level, uh, whenever we're able to take the heart back out, I think we're beginning to look at that as, as advanced. I think the mechanical devices have been the model that we've used to understand heart failure even more than transplantation because when the device goes in, the heart is failing dramatically and then they get a period of total support and they're in no heart failure whatsoever. And so gene expression differences between the two are likely the genes that control the remodeling and the recovery of the heart and again I think it's going to be a whole new set of targets that will be for pharmacologic intervention or other interventions. So I think the devices have played a bigger role in our understanding of fundamental basic science mechanisms of heart failure whereas transplantation is an end therapy for when there, nothing has gone better and we've gained over the years in looking at the explanted heart to be sure and that's what's really been the basis of our enthusiasm to try and learn how to control recovery because the heart looks like it's remodeled a great deal. It just hasn't been able to start it up. And that's probably the last thing that we're really focusing on is this concept of atrophy and how do you reload the heart and take advantage of normal startling relationships and don't let it be completely unloaded all this time and then have these small brief moments of let's see if it's ready to, to you know, take over the circulation and it's just totally unconditioned. So. I think that we'll do a lot of things differently five years from now, whether it's a period of minimum support for 15 seconds every five minutes, or at night you'll spin down and very little support and the heart will have to work when the, when the body's resting. I think there'll be some really substantial changes in some of the programming of the devices as we go forward. You um, just returned from Rwanda. Yes. And uh, could you tell us a little bit about why you went to Rwanda, how long you were there, and what you actually accomplished while you were there. It sounds like a fascinating trip. It's uh, undoubtedly the most gratifying time I've had in my career over there. It's uh, a good friend of mine, Chip Bowman, uh, had gotten connected with uh, some people who were partners in health and were running health care in Rwanda. And they got talking about all of the kids with rheumatic heart disease and what a, there was one cardiologist in a country of 10 million people. And so they had gone the year before last, and so last year I absolutely wanted to volunteer and go and have this experience, and, and it so exceeded anything I'd ever seen. I, I hadn't seen people who are living so meagerly and so subsistence living have such grace and dignity and are so grateful. There's, there's no net there. There's no Medicaid, city health will pick you up or whatever else these people have. That government is just too impoverished to really see this and we see kids that weighed 70 pounds at 16, 18 years of age because of the growth impairment from chronic rheumatic heart disease and it is so compelling when you see what can be done to these kids are going to die of this condition and so we've operated on 17 last year and 15 this year and it's it's very heart-wrenching because it's uh, it's a choice it's like allocating devices or transplantation because you can only do so many critically sick uh, youngsters and, um, and you have to decide who's not going to survive literally till the next team comes down. So that's really challenging. You ask yourself, you're operating on 30 uh, youngsters that uh, in a country where there are hundreds and hundreds and how do those get picked and selected. And so they're just you have to stay focused on you're really making an impact. We're really spent a lot of time giving lectures 
to all of the local nurse practitioners who frequently are the primary care for most of these because there aren't cardiologists and those who are beginning to come into the country to try and build a, an enhanced presence there that can take over doing more interventions, as simple operations, screening kids. Uh, we, we screened uh, 50 children in an orphanage and it was interesting that none of them had any evidence of rheumatic disease, but when we look at the children we did operate on, it was this growth impediment that would have been three, four standard deviations below what they should be expected to be in height and weight. And I think if we just use that as a screening mechanism, I think we'll try and find kids before the disease becomes even more uh, clinically advanced and more complex where you're doing three valves rather than one valve because it's so in, in series. So, um, but it, it just took you away from the university, the you know, anything and everything you want to order and so forth and just got back down to fundamental medicine. We went out in the clinics in the rural areas of Rwanda and saw kids that had had these surgeries living in grass floor huts, dirt floors, and, and you realize that it's just what their world is like and yet beaming, radiant. The kids were happy, playing, smiling. It's just, it's the same basic fundamentals, but it really tells you that that happiness is not predicated on how much income, how much resources are available to you. It's, uh, it's just a fundamental thing and these kids were just so heartwarming. It was an amazing experience and similarly this time it was, uh, it was equally exciting. So you've been there twice? Yes, each of the last two years for about uh, almost two weeks. You stay for two weeks. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting experience. It's literally setting up a mass unit. I mean, we, we start with an empty room with curtains between the beds that they vacate and we brought 5,000 pounds of equipment and set up. We, our pharmacy was three huge lockers that had drugs and the pharmacist was right there so the nurse would walk 10 steps and get the drug and the drip that she needed and walk right back over. There was no phone call and this and that and we had brought all the monitoring and ventilators and uh, literally if we didn't bring it, it wasn't there. Every suture, they brought all their surgical trays, all those things. and. So the technical things from that were really there. We were just docs and stethoscopes and, an, and a portable echo machine, and that's really what we were out screening patients with. And it, it just, it was so simplistic, and yet we saw 16 people in the city hospital, and nine of them we moved on to the list. We just kept reiterating what, who was on the list because we'd see sicker you know, individuals and have to keep moving it, so. How many of you were there? There were two cardiologists and two surgeons and I think the team was 40. Mm -hmm. Most of them were nurses. Uh, there were two anesthesiologists, two surgeons, two cardiologists were the physician corps, and two intensivists, so six, eight. And the rest were nurses that either did intensive care, they brought their operating room group, and step-down unit. So everybody were really in their element of where they worked typically to bring that. But I think there were eight programs that were involved from three in Boston, Minnesota, Washington, um, New Jersey, uh, and uh, two people from California. Is there a special organization that, that coordinates this? Or? Uh, this was called Team Heart. It's uh, pretty much a startup from uh, Chip Bowman and his wife Sia at the Brigham, which is their connect with partners in health. And so they've been the fundamental organization. They had a blog, they had some website now that kind of keeps track of this. But it's, it's linked to partners in health, and yet they don't subsidize any of this. It's all been independent fundraising. Uh, initiative to go down there and do this uh, humanitarian work. And you and Dr. Bowman worked together at St. Louis University, right? He was at WashU, but so we worked together there, but then when he went to Minnesota, then I became chief. We spent 10 years where I was chief of cardiology and he was chief of cardiac surgery, so we, we've had a long relationship like that, and that's why it's just, I, I couldn't resist going, and I, I'll go for the rest of my life. Really? No, oh, it, it truly is the most rewarding I've ever done. I, I, they interviewed us, they were doing a, a video last time and I just said I felt like I, all the training I had taken and, and gone through was to be there for those two weeks to bring all that skill set to that because it was so, so incredibly uh, touching to be there. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us and thank you for sharing your time with us to capture this the, the history of, of heart and lung transplantation, mechanical circulatory assist devices. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for asking me.